Time to elevate. Everybody, welcome to Running on Empty. I am Matt. And I am Tony. And we're running on empty. And this week we've got a really awesome show for you. Tony, tell us all about it, man. <laughs> yes, this is a very special show. We've got the chair of my department of comm studies at UW Oshkosh, and her name is Dr. Jennifer Considine. And she's going to talk about what's going on in higher ed in this pandemic era. How is it impacting our teaching and our faculty and student morale? and things of that nature. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Consonine. She's in her third year as Comm Studies Department Chair at UW Oshkosh. She's been a professor at UWO for 12 years. Her expertise is in the field of organizational communication. Her primary research explores the challenges of communicating about emotion, stress, and spirituality in organizational settings and has been published in the journals Health Communication and Management Communication Quarterly. Those are some of the more prestigious journals in our field. Like many academics, Jennifer works to balance a number of roles, parent, partner, teacher, scholar, and activist, and she tries to do them all with a dedication to inclusion, equity, and compassion. And I can testify to that. I've been working with Jennifer for a while, and yes, you are all about inclusion, equity, and compassion. And that might be a good place to start. I mean, have you found that those values are what you're having to call on being a teacher and a chair during this pandemic? Absolutely. So uh, thanks for having me here today, Tony and Matt. I'm really glad to be with you. I, I think absolutely we're having to think about inclusion equity and compassion across the board i mean sometimes it's just simple things like a student doesn't have internet access or they have very limited internet access or they're sharing a computer with four other people in the family and mom's trying to work from home dad's trying to work from home and a younger sibling is going to school well, our college student is also using that exact same computer um, to do their schoolwork. So I think we really have to think about how do we include all of our students, those that can be in the classroom and those that can't, how do we think about the challenges um, that everyone is facing in this particular moment? And it, it does, it requires a lot of compassion. And I've talked a lot about students, but I think we have to have compassion for faculty and staff too. I mean, many of us are teaching while our kids are in virtual learning at home, right? So um, I, right now, my two kids are downstairs on their virtual meetings, and I had to run down and say, okay, you got everything you need for your 1030. I got a 1030. <laughs> and then we all cross our fingers and hope the bandwidth supports all three of our, our Zoom <laughs> calls for the next hour, right? So I think we have to be compassionate for the challenges um, that each other are are facing. And I think, uh, lastly, I'll say that equity is a really important word for me. I think when I started teaching, I used to think about equality and how do we treat everybody exactly the same. Um, I've since come to learn that we really need to think about equity, right? So what is each student, um, each staff member, each faculty member, what kind of support do they need to be successful? And then we provide that in whatever forms we can. And of course, those are issues even pre-pandemic, right? Absolutely. So yeah, Absolutely. so they've, they've been magnified during this time. Yeah, without a doubt. I think we're seeing it magnified, you know, tenfold. I think yesterday about, uh, I had a student email me um, saying, you know, due to my mental health, I just can't come to class for the next month. I'm so overwhelmed with everything wow. that I'm facing. Wow. Um, and I, I just, I don't think I can do this. And I said, okay, well, let's talk and see if we can come up with a strategy for what you can do right now. And, and we've had students with mental health challenges as long as I've been teaching and before that. And I think we're just now starting to figure out how to be more supportive and how to, how to adapt what we're doing. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, you might recall, Jennifer, at the, at the start of the semester, um, our, our school newspaper at UW Oshkosh is called the Advanced Titan. And you might recall that uh, one of the editors wrote an article where he said that despite the best efforts of professors, the education is going to be a joke. And I, and I responded to that by saying, you know, we've got challenges, but it's not a joke. I mean, has it been your sense that as challenging as this online hybrid 
online only kind of environment has been. Have we managed to maintain the high quality of education? Are, are people getting their, their money's worth? Yeah. So I can certainly speak to this in our department and the answer is unequivocally yes. Right. I mean, I absolutely. Our students are getting their money's worth. Awesome. And I think I'm, I'm a perpetual optimist, but I'm really excited, too, about the new skills our students are getting. Right. So the, the shift to virtual learning has been unbelievably challenging, but it's also pushing us as faculty to learn new things and it's pushing our students to learn and practice new skills. So I sat in on a public speaking class that a colleague is teaching last week and all of the students had to do an impromptu speech via video chat. Right. And that's something that they're all going to have to do someday when they're in a virtual meeting, because our virtual meetings aren't going to go away, even post pandemic. Right. right. And so the students are getting and being forced to practice the skills of how am I going to give a speech in a Zoom call when my boss says, I need to know your opinion on this. And the right. pandemic is allowing us to teach those skills and allowing the students to practice those skills. Um, I also think we're going to we're having to get creative. I just kicked off a project <laughs> in my communication and nonprofit class yesterday um, where my students are doing virtual interviews um, with the board members of a community health clinic that provides free health care. And then they're going to put together webinars. They're going to bring together research and put together webinars of information that will help the board members manage the challenges that the clinic is facing. Oh, wow. And pre-pandemic, we couldn't have done a project like this because I wouldn't have been quite creative enough to think, how do we serve a nonprofit two hours away? And now we can serve a nonprofit two hours away because we're getting comfortable with virtual learning. And, and I'm certainly doing those things, but I also see my colleagues doing those things across the board. I know, Tony, you and I, and Matt, you've participated in this. We've had yep. alumni call in from around the country uh, to visit our classes and to share their experience with students. And that's been great learning for students, especially those who are thinking about moving across the country. What and is that I, like? Yes, and I gotta say, and you know, Matt, you participated in that, so we have, yep. Our former students, as Jennifer said, from various parts of the country. And I tell you, I got such a tremendous response from the current students. That's awesome. They were inspired. They felt motivated. They were just thrilled to hear what our graduates do when they get out of school. And, you know, I, again, I, I, it's one of those silver linings of education in this era. I mean, we did have the technology to do that before. Yeah. But this has kind of pushed us to do it and it's worked out really well. I've also found Jennifer, I don't know if this you found this also. Um my advising of students has improved. <laughs> and I've been <laughs> advising for many years because I have found that like in the Zoom calls we get to put their advising sheets like literally right in front of their face. And, you know, and don't get me wrong, I love having students in my office, but sometimes we're sitting there in our office and we're talking about the advising report, but usually you're the only one looking at it as the advisor. And I have found in this model, uh, our, even the conversations seem to be a little bit more meaningful. Has that been your experience? Yeah, I, I will say that I have, I, I'm a little mixed on that, right? Because I really miss for advising the students just yeah. coming into my office and sitting down and chatting, right? Um, I, I get a lot of drop in advising because my office is downstairs yeah. on the first floor where everybody walks by and I so miss that. But I will say that I think the opportunity for students to be able to request virtual meetings with us and the, <clears throat> the broadening of the times maybe that we're available for those meetings to them um, or that they're available to us because they don't have to drive back and forth. Right? right. So we're getting to chat with students that we haven't chatted with before. Um, and certainly, right, screen sharing, screen sharing is fantastic, right? This, yeah. is, this is a great thing <laughs> that we can do that we've all discovered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what what has been your view now as a as a department chair, you've obviously have administrative responsibilities. Have those responsibilities changed significantly in this time period? Well, I think, uh, and Tony, you could speak to this as well. We had a busier summer than we've ever had. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my department, at, like most academic departments, we don't meet much at all in a normal summer. Um, our department met every two weeks for a call to just plan for the fall, to test out the new technologies before we taught. Most of us took courses in online teaching mm -hmm. this summer. 
Um, so I think, you know, our, our burden of preparing for the school year was a lot greater. Um, as department chair, uh, we've done a ton of work too, just thinking about changing course modes and what does that mean and how do we communicate to our instructors um, what the course mode is. So for those who aren't familiar with this conversation, right here on campus, you can go to class this year in three different ways. So you can go to class fully online. We never ever see you um, and you uh, sign up for that in advance. You can go to class in a version that's called High Flex, which is you show up during our class time, but we don't know if you're gonna be on the Zoom call version of class or if you're gonna be sitting in the classroom, we have no idea. Um, or you can sign up for where you come to class regularly, but you might not be there um, uh, every day of the week, right? So we have lots of different ways we're trying to teach to accommodate the needs of our students, which is great, um, but communicating those, planning for those, making sure that we have enough variety of modes to meet the needs of our students um, has been very challenging. Uh, certainly another challenge is if somebody in our department um, gets COVID, right? And has oh, yeah, had to yeah. isolate or quarantine. And that's happened in our department. Um, and in some cases we had instructors who felt fine and were able to just carry on teaching online. Um, in other cases, we had instructors that really couldn't function, right? And the rest of us had to step in as colleagues and, and cover those classes. And so uh, I have the privilege of working in a great department where if we say somebody needs help, people step up and we provide help. But there certainly has been a lot more coordinating of those kinds of things to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Matt, do you want to jump in here? Um, well, I'm taking a look at the, the way that learning is happening now. And I'm, you know, my, my experience back in the 80s was, you know, we didn't have anything like this. So what I, what I think is cool about all this technology is that, and being, you know, in communications here, is that this is almost like a new class uh, you know, and, and being on LinkedIn a lot, um, I see that there's people now that are specialists and helping people prepare to do great online interviews. I mean, so it's, it's, I, I think this is something that the communication department, you know, is, is really embracing with open arms because there's so many possibilities, new ways to communicate. Um, is that what you're, is that what you're seeing, Jennifer? Yeah, that's absolutely what I'm seeing, right? I mean, awesome. my final assignment in the class is having my students produce a webinar. And I've had cool. to go out and learn a lot okay. about how in the world do you do that in, in the best possible fashion, right? So yeah, I think we are un undoubtedly taking advantage of these new opportunities. And I, when I think back to how would we have done this in the past, right? I think that old school model of a correspondence course, like would I have had to like <laughs> package up exams and mail them to my students and have them mail them back to me, right? I'm not, I'm not sure what that would have looked like. I also think that would have been so much harder for students who aren't uh, visual learners, right? We have right. some students who learn by reading and that correspondence course model works for them. But uh, for our students who learn by listening or learn by watching, this model I think is so rich. And I've learned a lot about how I can change my teaching even moving forward to provide better teaching for students who learn in different ways. I'm a reader, yeah. I can learn yeah. by reading. Um, that's probably a third of my students. And so I'm having to rethink how I teach. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I'm guessing this is also, this would also go for faculty because I know that there's got to be some faculty that really understands the technology, knows how to use it, is pretty in tune with that stuff. And there have to be others that just don't really have a clue, not to say anything bad about them, but they're just not technically savvy. And so even, even a course in, you know, like training the trainer, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that they're as, as versed as they can be for the purposes of what they want to use it for. Um, I mean, you sound like you're pretty, pretty well, you know, set on Zoom and things like that and, and, and uh, technology, but I, I, have you encountered folks that, um, that you've had to kind of help along or coach a little bit to be, you know, like we, we don't, we, we're just, this isn't clicking with us. So what, what do you it, think? Technical support has definitely been my unexpected role as chair. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and thankfully, I have another. We have a couple of colleagues who are great at this, and I think we provide technical support regularly. Um, I often get phone calls like, "How do you do this?" or "How do you find this?" Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are folks that have had challenges. Um, not to get too political, but the economic consequences of where education has been has also made this challenging in some ways, simply because not our not our skills and abilities with the technology, but the lack of technology. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, we did get some we did get some support from the university this summer to purchase webcams for faculty, which was really helpful. Most of us didn't have them um, to purchase headsets, uh, and again, that was really helpful. But we have a lot of staff that are working on six, seven, eight year old laptops, uh, and we don't have backup laptops around. Wow. Um, and there just isn't the budget for computer replacement every four years. So I think those challenges um, really add to some of the dilemmas that we face. Two weeks ago, I had a colleague call me on a Friday afternoon and say, uh, my computer stopped working. And I said, well, it's seven years old. This is not surprising. You got it when you started as a faculty member and now you're tenured. Um, You know, but it was a Friday afternoon and she had a whole bunch of work to do over the weekend and in a big scramble to try to figure out how do we get a new computer into her hands. And I think that's a technology that maybe or a challenge that maybe education is facing uniquely that some other places aren't. I mean, certainly a lot of businesses also have that challenge, but some don't. And that's when we haven't talked about a whole lot. So I'm guessing on the alumni side that we're going to get like a a letter saying, you know, you could donate to this technology fund that we're going to be raising money for. So, oh, um, yeah, because I remember, you know, back in 1987, uh, you know, in the dorms was, all right, you know, we've got a computer for the floor. Um, and then if I wanted to do anything for any of my classes, I had to go down to this little computer lab and these orange, you know, CRT screens were lighting up. I'm like, and that was in the eighties going, I can't even imagine, you know, back then trying to be in my, my dorm room, having a pandemic and trying to figure out, you know, cause I lived in the library, you know, I had Tony for a professor. I lived in the library. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I couldn't have found Thaddeus Stevens stuff anywhere else. I don't think Tony, but yeah. anyway, um, well, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it sucks that there's, you know, some of the challenges, but it's so cool that, you know, for, for folks like you to be around that, that are in the know and can help people out and, you know, hey, you know, you're still using Windows 95, maybe it's time for an upgrade, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Jennifer, one of your scholarly areas is, you know, we said stress in organizational uh, settings. So this seems to be a very high stress time. And what has been your way of of managing that within your department or within our department? Um, what could you say about that? Yeah, so I think it's a it's a super high stress time. Uh, we certainly in our department, to use the academic term, are trying to provide a lot of social support. So yeah. really providing opportunities for people to to chat about what the challenges are, to brainstorm solutions. Um, I really try to rethink the approach to department meetings even, Mm -hmm. to allow a little bit of time for what might normally happen in hallway conversations. You know, in a regular year, we brainstorm a lot, we support each other, we check in with each other a whole lot when we run into each other in the hallway. And we don't run into each other in the hallway anymore, right? Right. Because we're all working from home and that can be very isolating. So I think trying to provide opportunities for people to connect. I know some of my colleagues have a Facebook chat that's continually going and like, here are the the challenges that we're facing. Um, And as a department chair, I've made a deliberate choice not to join that Facebook chat, partly because I think, you know, people should get an opportunity to vent without their supervisor there, right? Even though I'm like nominated to that role right now. (laughs) Um, But so I think it's important that we have those places to, to vent. I think the other thing that causes us a lot of stress is our role conflict right? Our work-life balance, our, I can't be a good mom and a good professor Mm -hmm. or a good dad and a good professor, you know, all of those different roles that we're facing. And I think we've tried to do a good job in our department of being flexible, right? So if somebody says like, I really need to teach from home for a week because my kid's daycare closed, right? Or somebody says, my mom's really sick. I have to take her in for surgery. I need to quarantine for the next two weeks so that I can go see my mom. Like those are the kinds of things that we need to figure out how to be able to accommodate. And I'm, I'm actually happy that academia is starting to have a better conversation around work-life balance. I mean, Tony, Tony may remember this. When I had my first child, it was my first year at Oshkosh. Um, I, I literally took three days of maternity leave yeah. and then was, was back, um, which, wow. which was fine. It worked out okay. Um, but that's not something that we really want to keep doing to people. Right. And so I think we're in a place where maybe we can have a new conversation about how do we balance our multiple roles and reconsider place where we work. 
right? And do we really need to have FaceTime the way we always used to think we had to have FaceTime to just show that we were working? And so I hope that all institutions can start rethinking those kinds of questions. Yeah, I agree. And I and I also think that the I think that many faculty and I and this has been a this has been a big adjustment for me. I, I think that we don't always appreciate the stress the students are under. Right. I, I have noticed that a lot of teachers around the campus are trying to recreate this new setting in a way that kind of approximates what we were doing in the classroom. In other words, to make this normal. And I have to keep telling myself, this is not normal. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that, you know, students are, are, are under a high amount of stress. But it, to us, it, it, if we just look at it through our eyes, it might not look like stress. Correct. Right. It might look like they're being irresponsible. For example, especially in my first year class, uh, many of my students are falling behind. And I think it's a mistake for me to look at that as, well, they're just not doing their homework. I need to be more rigorous or, you know, more stern. I think they are extremely scared. Mm -hmm. All right. I've had many students on our campus, like most campuses now we have, I guess they call it the isolation dorm. All right. When you, when your roommate has COVID, you have to go into isolation or whatnot. And I've talked to quite a few students now that have been in this isolation dorm and it's a, it's scary, right? I mean, they're treated well and all that, but you know, the food is not great. And some person uh, or one student was telling me it gets really hot in there. They can't control the temperature. They, they use like, uh, prison metaphors to describe it. It sounds like Grunhagen, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but which is one of the residence halls on our on our campus. Yeah. So I I don't know if faculty. I don't know if we have been properly trained on how to recognize signs of high student stress. Mm -hmm. Do, well, you, do you agree with that? My questions is is you know what what's the university doing about like mental health and 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 stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, our, I mean, our counseling center is still providing virtual meetings. Our dean of students is, is still reaching out to students. They've started a first year mentoring program with incoming students. Um, every, every Monday we get emails, right, about um, mental health resources on campus. And so I think all of that, all of that helps. Um, but it's, it, we don't have training as counselors, right, as nope. faculty members, but we are often the first line to recognize when students yeah. are struggling. Um, and we're in a unique moment where two years ago, if I had a student in my office who was struggling, I could literally walk with them over to the counseling center. Sure. And now it's, you know, it's now it's, can you sit here while we make a phone call to hook you up with the virtual meeting with the counseling center, right? And, and I think that's really hard, right? And students, sometimes what they really want is they just like want to go home and get a hug from mom and dad, right? I had a student in my office two weeks ago and I said, you know, you just seem to really be struggling right now. And the student said, yeah, I want to go home and my family won't let me. Oh, wow. Because they were, you know, the family had some high risk individuals and the student was told sure. you need to make a choice, right? Like you either go to school and don't see us or you come home, which is an absolutely horrible choice to have to make, but a very realistic one that a lot of our students are facing. Mm -hmm. And so I think no matter how much training we have, right, how do we counsel? each other through this time, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, how do we, you know, I think we, we listen, we say, I see you, right? But I, I agree, Tony, I think it's, it's really hard. It's overwhelming. I also think for our first year students, I mean, they've gotten a raw deal. They didn't get yeah. to have their graduation last spring. They right. didn't get to say goodbye to their high school friends the same way they expected. You know, they show up to college and it's not like, let's go hang out and play Frisbee, right? It's, right let's sit in our dorms. And so I think their stress levels are just enormously high. And I do think that, uh, I think they're becoming a little bit more, I don't know if activist is the right word, but like, for example, I found this year that I would say to my students, okay, I've got this thing I do called voting 101 that I generally do, as you know, for like campus groups. Do you want me to do this in the classroom? Every single class I taught said, yes, let let us know about what's going on with this election. I found that to be a good sign. I, I I didn't find many students this time who were apathetic about what's going on uh, nationally or in our state. Was that your experience too? 
Yeah, that was absolutely my experience, right? I think students are more engaged, they're speaking up, um, they're advocating for other people, right? Which yeah. is really great to see, right? You know, to see the Titans Unite rallies that are happening on our campus, the students coming together and saying, you know what, Black Lives Matter, what are we gonna do about police brutality, right? What are we gonna do to make this a more inclusive and welcoming campus? Uh, and I think it's great to see that and great to see students really engaged with the electoral process as well. I right. love that you did voting 101 in your classes, yeah. especially this year, because for a lot of our students, it was hard to figure out how do you vote, right? It used to yeah. be that we could tell them, hey, walk to this building on campus and go vote. This year it was much more complicated. Yeah, in fact, in the voting 101 this year, I, I took what was actually gonna be on the ballot and showed it to the students so that when you mm -hmm. vote, here's what you, you will see. I've had several students come to me in the last few days saying, thank you for doing that, because had we not heard that, I would have went in, voted for the presidential election, and went home, <laughs> right, and left the rest of the ballot blank. And wow. so thank you for letting us know, because they were going to, they didn't know who the congressional candidates were. We had others, uh, you know, state assembly, state senate. I didn't tell anyone who to vote for, but I said, here's how you get information. And students who went and did that were thankful that they did. So, you know, those are some good signs. So they they went in and researched then on, you know, like, so here's the candidates and, and yes. they went in and, and did their homework as to, you know, what each one stood for, the issues. Yes, um, they did. I, like I know in Colorado here, we had all these different propositions and they send you this book. It's this, you know, half inch thick book. And it explains if you're voting yes for this, this is mm -hmm. what you're voting for. If you're voting no. So I'm guessing those resources, I mean, it was cool that you guided folks towards that because, um, around here, even, you know, like, well, if I don't know, I'm just going to vote for the president and that's it. So exactly. now these, these ballots get filled out completely, which that's awesome. Yeah. You know, I, Jennifer, on a, a, another issue, um, this pandemic crisis in higher ed is happening at the same time we're facing major budget issues, right? Major enrollment issues. Do you see the University of Wisconsin, and this is a big question, but do you see the UW system as being in a good place to handle these kinds of issues? Or do you think, I know there's a lot of fear out there that we might we might suffer such enrollment crises that we're going to lose campuses or lose entire academic programs. Do you, do you have reason to be optimistic going forward for our campus and for the UW as a whole? So uh, I guess I would say uh, both and, right? I mean, my optimism comes from the idea that we have really smart people, yeah. right? Who are advocating and who are educating. Yeah. And, and we have dedicated alumni who are saying what, you know what, this really, really matters, right? This matters, education matters, and we need to do this. Um, we also have had a lot of budget cuts, right? A lot of budget mm -hmm. cuts at the state level. Um, and our, that's scary, right? And yes. the conversation around education is scary. Um, and I think, you know, in our department, there are a lot of new questions to be asked about target markets and who do we reach out to? Our traditional student population of 18 year olds who are wanting to go to college is shrinking, right? And mm -hmm. there are gonna be a lot of adults, I think, that are gonna wanna return to school, right? Yes. And they, they wanna come back and they wanna get an education. Um, and I think there's a little, I think we can serve those populations. I'm excited about it. I think there's great opportunity there. I do have a little fear that we would get reduced to a job preparation system. Exactly. Right. We're, we're about more than that, right? Your voting 101 example is exactly that, right? We're about thinking about being community members. We're about knowing how to research when the propositions come up. We're about knowing how to advocate for a new proposition or a change in your community to benefit your community, right? And so I don't want to see us, our department, or our institutions get reduced to just job training. I think job training is an absolutely key core element of what we do. We should sure. do it. We should do it well. Right. Um, but we're also about liberal education. And we're also about creating citizens. And we're also about people who can think through wicked problems from multiple perspectives. Yeah. And, you know, if, if there, you know, we're facing wicked problems, poverty, climate change, racial justice, those are wicked problems. And the choices we make with how to manage them are going to have a lot of ripple effects and unintended consequences. 
And we have to be able to think about those in nuanced ways. And I think our history courses, our philosophy courses, our rhetoric courses, our religious studies courses, those are gonna teach people how to do that. Those are the ones that I fear sometimes get put on the chopping block. Oh, I, I you know, that is so well stated. And I can't think of a time when the liberal arts have been as vital as they are right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet you're right. They tend to end up first on the chopping block. And that, that's tragic. Another thing that disturbs me is that we have so many people who think of education simply as the transfer of content. Right? <laughs> okay, so we'll make a lecture and we'll deliver it to you either in a classroom or online and be done with it. And we take away the whole relationship part of education, the whole interaction part. I mean, Matt, you, yeah. when you reflect <laughs> back on your time at UW Oshkosh, it wasn't all about lectures, was it? No. I mean, you, obviously, in your first year or so, you've got uh, you know a, a bunch of pit classes and whatnot, and you're getting information and you basically mm -hmm. regurgitate it. But then as you get into your upper level classes, um, you, you know, you're you're presented information, but not necessarily you're not given the answers. You're supposed to look for them. You're supposed to be a free thinker. Um, right. I'll, you know, even going back to when we went in 1991, uh, when we went to the, the Peace March in Milwaukee, you know, that's <laughs> not something you teach in a classroom, you know? This is something that you actually experience. And I mean, no, no, um, there, there was no, you know, you're going to decide this way or the other way, go and, and decide for yourself what it's like. And those, those things I, I think are lacking. There's a lot of it on social media now. So it's, it's being presented in a different way, but um, there is still the opportunity, I think now to, to be, uh, to, to not just have to regurgitate things. I hated classes like that. I had a, a, a philosophy class where uh, it was, the question was why, Th that was it. It was one question, middle of the page. I actually wrote a story on it and um, people were writing for hours and hours and hours on, you know, all the different things. And I just wrote down a few sentences and turned it in and got an A mm -hmm. because I, I gave the professor what he wanted, not like the theories of why and who came up with it and all the other stuff. I just gave him what he wanted. So that was a regurgitation. Whereas I really kind of wanted to put some thought into some things. And that's why I really liked the communication is because um, I was kind of upset at first, but I actually had to think, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that that, and that, that that was there. And I, and I still think it's possible now. I mean, are, are you seeing that? Uh, I was going to say, I guess the question was, do you, do you see a lot of students kind of, you know, diving into it a little bit more because they are presented with a new learning? Because some people are really up on it and some people aren't. So are they, are you finding that more people are taking that initiative to do it and not just regurgitate stuff? I think our students in particular love it when we don't make them just regurgitate, right? Yeah. Um, I, I tell my students, I don't want you to leave my class with all the answers. I want you to leave with better questions, awesome. right? Because often they come in with really simple questions. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, but like, that's not the important question, right? <laughs> like the, the important question, a question we just debated in my nonprofit class was, um, how much should we pay nonprofit CEOs, right? So executive mm -hmm. directors of nonprofits, how much should we pay them? Um, and, the, and the students were like, well, let's look at the market data. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. like, why did we start with market data? Right. Why, why should we look there? Right. So just to get us to some of the root ideologies that are forcing us to think in particular ways that we take so much for granted. And I think the students, they like to get into those debates. Awesome. I'm teaching a class right now that is 100% case study driven. So I do an online lecture each week where they can learn the stuff that I would want them to regurgitate. But we spend the vast majority of our time in class discussing a case study. This week, for example, That's we cool. discussed um, the gift catalog for Heifer International, which is this really glossy, really great gift catalog where they're getting people to donate money to purchase livestock to give to people in poverty. And all of the images depict really, really happy people receiving these goats right? These cows. And I was like, I grew up on a goat farm. That's not how it is. Like, you know, raising goats is hard, hard work. Um, and it's dirty work and it's messy work, but we don't depict it that way. Sure. Right. And, and then we had a really great conversation about how do you market the marginalized, right? Whose voice gets to take precedence when we tell the stories of people who are living in poverty, who gets right. to choose what those images are? Is it the people who are running the charities 
Or is it the people themselves who are experiencing poverty that they should get to say how their story is told? Right. Yeah. And that I think is the, those are the kinds of questions that we really need students talking about. Right. Not just which of these images is going to make us the most money. Exactly. But what are the ethics of depicting something using this image? Well, Dr. Right. Constantine, we know you have to get to another meeting soon. So we're going to we're going to come to a close here. And, uh, you know, I, I want Matt and I both want to thank you for just thank I you think, so much. giving. Yeah. Giving us some really enlightening perspectives on what's going on in academia. I, I suspect that what's going on in our Department of Comm Studies is probably typical in many programs around our campus and uh, nationally. Do you have like maybe one last thought you want to leave uh, people with? So I just say one thing that we didn't talk about that I think uh, maybe this is a future show for you, but we didn't talk about um, the role of research right now, right? Oh, yeah. And the, oh, yeah. the pressure of tenure on faculty who are spending all this time updating their teaching and what that means for what we're doing with research. So I, I just throw that out there because I know in about two hours, we're having a conversation about how to navigate tenure in the post-COVID world. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's, a, that's an entirely different conversation, but maybe a future podcast. I, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I think just the idea of tenure itself has been under assault for so many years now. And my concern is that we've got some of our more unscrupulous politicians who might use this crisis as a way to, to take even more shots at, at the at tenure. So you're right. We need to do another show on that. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Jen. Thanks thank so you so much. much for having me. All right. We'll see you next bye -bye. time. Take care. <laughs> bye. Wow, Tony, that was an awesome interview. Yeah, Dr. Considine is just really such a thoughtful educator and she's just been a tremendous chair of my department of comm studies and i and i hope our listeners you know develop an appreciation for what we're dealing with in higher ed and it's nice to know that we have such thoughtful people like dr Considine. i wish you had been the chair when i was this. there <laughs> yeah yeah she's yeah. great she's so a, a really great show matt this has been fun we'll have to do it again we'll have to do it again all right that's our show this time everybody thanks so much for tuning in and uh stay elevated we'll see you next time Tony.